This might just look like a fairly standard PC, but that isn't a graphics card. It's actually a single board computer, and a fairly powerful one. But why is it in the form factor of a PCIe card? In this video, I'm going to talk about what this thing actually is and what it was originally intended for, but I'm also going to show you the goofy way that I used it, and why it might actually be more useful than even I originally thought. So let's get started. Now over the past week or so, I've had a lot of fun messing around with this weird computer, but I've also had a lot of fun playing War Thunder, the sponsor of today's video. War Thunder is one of the most comprehensive vehicle combat games where you get to take command of over 2,500 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships of 10 major nations. These range from century-old biplanes and armored cars to jets and tanks of the modern era. The attention to detail, realistic graphics, and authentic sound effects make you feel like you're the one in the driver's seat or cockpit. Oh, and did I mention you can play for free? As a bit of a history nerd and aviation buff, I find myself really enjoying the plane battles, but taking command of a tank was actually quite a bit more fun than I thought it would be. While there are simulation and realistic modes for a bit more immersion, I love how easy it is to hop into the arcade mode for a quick session. I might have actually done that a few times while working on this video. Another great thing about War Thunder is that while it looks great, the game is really well optimized and can run well even on low-end machines. If you're a fan of military history and you're looking for an exciting and immersive gameplay experience, join the community of over 70 million players on PC, Xbox, or PlayStation and give War Thunder a shot today for free. Use my link down in the description or pinned comment to get signed up. If you're a new player or you just haven't played for six months, you'll also receive a sweet bonus pack that includes multiple premium vehicles, the exclusive Eagle of Valor vehicle decorator, 100,000 silver lions, and seven days of premium account access. This is available for a limited time only, so don't miss out. Start playing War Thunder today. All right, back to this guy. On this channel, I like to cover computer hardware, typically used hardware, and find creative but helpful ways to put it to use. But I also like to cover just weird, wacky, goofy stuff sometimes, and I think this might actually fall into both of those categories. This is an Intel Nook 9 Pro compute unit that I picked up on Amazon for just $150 used, thanks to one of my viewers, Rahul. I really hope I'm saying your name right. Rahul sent me the Amazon link for these being sold for $150, bucks, and I just found it too interesting to not make a video on it. This originally used to be part of the Nook 9 Pro kit, which was a bare-bones Nook kit that came with the compute unit, as well as a chassis. It included a power supply, as well as a PCIe base board for adding the compute unit, as well as one to two PCIe cards. You might have actually seen coverage of these, at least the extreme models that are meant more for gaming and that sort of thing, back in 2020. This one is part of the Pro lineup though, and while the original case to this lacked any cool skulls, it did come with a Xeon E2286M, an 8-core, 16-thread CPU released back in 2019. This has a base clock of 2.4GHz and a max turbo frequency of up to 5GHz, and it comes with onboard Intel UHD P630 graphics. It's a bare bones kit, so it doesn't come with any RAM or storage, but it has two DDR4 SODIMM sockets that can support up to 64GB total. It also has two Gen 3x4 M.2 sockets, one of which can actually support the super long form factor 22110 NVMe SSDs. Such a long boy. On the back, there are two Thunderbolt 3 ports, four 10 gigabit per second USB ports, an HDMI port, and two one gigabit ethernet ports. There's also a three and a half millimeter combination speaker slash Toslink optical jack if you need audio. On the front, there's a power button, which is helpful, as well as this eight pin EPS power connector, which you will need to power this unit. Now, the reason this comes with a PCIe slot was originally so that you could slide it into the baseboard and the chassis, and these PCIe connections would connect to the actual PCIe slots. But is there anything keeping me from just plugging this into a computer? Well, I'm definitely not the first person to think of this. I actually found a video of Der Bauer doing this exact same thing, which was really helpful because it saved me quite a few hours probably of troubleshooting. But his use case that he pitched in that video was using this for a streaming PC. So if you had a main gaming PC, you could put this inside and use that to handle all of the streaming and encoding. And while that could possibly be a good use case, I thought it would be interesting to try something else. My idea is that if somebody has a DIY NAS running at their house, you could chuck this inside of it and set up virtual machines and containers or whatever services you might want to run. That way your NAS can just be a NAS. I typically tend to not want to run services on my NAS just because I don't want to risk that crashing or breaking somehow when I could run those services on a different machine. 
To test out this idea, I obviously need a PC to put this into. So I threw this one together inside this Dark Rock Classical case that I'll actually be using in a budget NAS build here soon, so stay tuned for that. I'm not going to talk about the specs of this system because they really don't matter. Really all you need is a power supply with a spare EPS 12 volt connector. Now this came as a bare bones kit, so there's no RAM or SSD. So I obviously wanted to add those before chucking it inside the host system. I dropped in two eight gigabyte sticks of DDR4, as well as two one terabyte NVMe SSDs. Now, if I were to just plug this in as is, these exposed PCIe pins would start to mess with the PCIe lanes on the host system. So it's a good idea to tape over some of these connectors. Now, fortunately, Derbauer covered this in his video and did all of the hard work on deciding which pins to tape off. So I'll make sure to link that down in the description. Now, a lot of people didn't like that I used painter's tape in a very similar project recently, and rightly so. So this time I used captain tape to cover up most of the pins following Derbauer's video. Now, as I was plugging it in and getting it hooked up, I realized that the HDMI port was blocked by this crossbar. Somehow I didn't even notice this when shooting B-roll beforehand. So sadly, I just had to cut out that crossbar section. Now, while this does get some power through the PCIe lanes, we also need to hook up the 8-pin EPS connector. And unfortunately, my power supply didn't have a second EPS connector, but it does have a PCIe power connection for a graphics card, and you can pick up some pretty cheap adapters on somewhere like Amazon. Now, sadly, the first adapter I ordered didn't get delivered properly, so I had to order a second one, which actually had a pretty glowing review from some guy named Jeff. Because there was a delay getting here, I originally started testing with a second power supply, but then once the adapter showed up, I plugged that in with no issues. After getting it all hooked up and plugged in, I was sort of expecting there to be some issues, but it booted up just fine and I was able to get into the UEFI. There, I set it to boot from USB and then installed Windows 11. Now during this process, I actually noticed that if the system idled, the fan would just stop spinning, which was pretty cool, but even when it was spinning, it was actually pretty quiet. Also, another issue I ran into very quickly was that if you don't set the host system to not go to sleep, it'll eventually go into a sleep state and cut power to the PCIe card and crash the system. So it's important that whatever system this is in, you need to make sure that it's not going to go to sleep, which if this is a home server or something, that's probably not a big deal. But if you're planning on putting this into a gaming PC, you might want to take that into consideration. After getting Windows 11 installed, I fired up Cinebench R23 just to get a rough idea of how the CPU stacks up against some other systems. The Nook 9 Pro system achieved a multi-threaded score of 8698 and a single-threaded score of 1229. Now for a couple of comparisons, I grabbed a Dell Optiplex I recently took a look at, which has a Ryzen 7 1700, as well as the Minis Forum MS01 with an Intel i9-13900H. The Intel Nook outperforms the older 8-core Ryzen 7 1700, but the MS01 with its 14-core 20-thread 13900H absolutely demolished the E2286M. Now you might be thinking, that's not a very fair comparison because those devices would be in totally different price brackets now. But if we start looking at power consumption, things get a little bit interesting. Now I should note here that I couldn't measure power draw the exact same way I would normally measure, which is just using a kilowatt from the wall, because, well, the system's drawing power from another system. So I figured out what the power draw for the host system was at idle, which was right around 32 watts. So in measuring what the Nook system power draw was, I just subtracted 32 watts from whatever was being read out on the kilowatt. When sitting idle in Windows, the system only drew 8 watts. When the CPU jumped up to its max turbo frequency when starting Cinebench though, the system power draw jumped to 161 watts, but then dropped down to 93 watts after the CPU clock settled. In comparison, the Dell Optiplex with the Ryzen 7 1700 idled at 30 watts, and the MS01 idled at 14 watts. So here the Nook looks pretty good. When running Cinebench R23 multi-threaded though, the Optiplex jumped up to 117 watts, but the 13900H only drew 107 watts initially, and then settled down to 84 watts. So at least when compared to some newer Intel chips, this little guy isn't incredibly efficient or anything, and can still draw a good bit of power under load. That's probably important to keep in mind when deciding if this could run alongside and share a power supply with the host system. I was originally nervous about temperatures, but they weren't too bad, at least with a very open case like this one from Dark Rock. The temps spiked initially during heavy workloads, but sustained temperatures never really got above 80 degrees Celsius, and I didn't see any thermal throttling in hardware info. Now obviously Windows was not what I originally planned for this thing. I wanted to run some virtual machines and containers to host a Minecraft server or run Jellyfin or Home Assistant, so I installed Proxmox. 
The only weird issue I had here was that when trying to run the installer, it got stuck on trying to detect a country, which I was fortunately able to fix pretty easily by just not having the network cable plugged in during installation. To quickly spin up some containers and virtual machines, I used some scripts from T-Tech, which I highly recommend you should check out, I'll make sure and link those down in the description. I started by setting up an LXC container to run Jellyfin, and this all worked exactly as expected. The integrated UHD graphics P630 isn't as good as some of the newer offerings from Intel, but I was still getting nearly 80 frames per second when transcoding 4K HEVC down to 1080p, and when transcoding 4K HDR using VPP tone mapping, I was still getting between 50 and 60 frames per second. I had no issues spinning up a virtual machine to run Home Assistant OS, and once again, I used the T-Tech script here. I also noticed that IOMMU was enabled by default, although I don't really know what you would use PCIe pass-through for, maybe one of the NICs or the Thunderbolt controller or something. I also set up Crafty Controller in an LXC because I thought this might be a good machine to run some Minecraft servers on. You could even, I don't know, you could chuck this inside a gaming PC and run Minecraft on your gaming PC but run all your servers on the NUC. I did get a server spun up with no issues, but sadly I couldn't test it because, well, my Minecraft launcher just didn't want to work. So thanks Microsoft. But I think we proved the point here, you can mod this thing just a little bit and chuck it into another system and sort of have a home server inside your home server, which I think is pretty cool. But there is one issue with that, which is that you kind of lose a lot of physical access to this if it's inside another case. But fortunately, one of the features of this Intel Xeon is that it supports Intel AMT, which is their feature for remote management. When first turning on the system, you can hold down Control p to access MEBX, which I guess is basically just a BIOS feature to enable and adjust the settings for AMT. Once you get there, you can set up a password, configure the network settings, and essentially enable the service, and then using something called Mesh Commander, which I have running in a Docker container, I was able to access the system remotely. With this, you can turn the system on or off, see system status, and have remote access. So it's just like you're sitting at that computer with a monitor, mouse, and keyboard. And what's really cool is because this isn't running on an operating system or in software, you can actually get to the UEFI, and if you wanted to, you could even reinstall the operating system remotely. Now, realistically, if you really wanted a smaller system to be tucked inside a larger system, you could pick up one of many available mini PCs and even just Velcro it inside and figure out a way to power it from the power supply. But while I found this solution to be kind of quirky, it was still satisfying in a way. Not only does it kind of look cool, it actually serves a pretty useful purpose. Like I've said before, I don't like running services on my NAS and I like to put them in a separate system. And so if you're limited on space and you already have a like true NAS box or something you've built in a desktop case, it kind of makes sense that you could just chuck this in the bottom PCIe slot or whatever and have another system in a nice contained solution. And at least for the $150 I spent, I think it's a pretty good deal. You get pretty good CPU performance for such a small form factor, and while it can draw a lot of power under heavy load, the very low idle power means it's not gonna run up your electricity bill if you're just running some simple services most of the time. Most importantly though, I just had a lot of fun checking out this system, and I really hope you guys had fun as well. And if you're looking for some more fun, maybe go play some more Thunder. Remember, you can play for free, so click my link down in the description and you can get access to some premium vehicles and some other cool goodies. And once again, thanks to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. I think that's pretty much it for this one though. So as always, thank you guys so much for watching. Stay curious, and I can't wait to see you in the next one.